not as slick as it should be. Forgive me if the PowerPoint doesn't quite align everything what I'm saying, uh, but we can blame Paul for that. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted to, uh, to uh, share this morning was about 2020, 2023. Uh, Sophie and I went out for uh, a meal in January, and we had one of those times where we said, well, what's going to be our financial goal for this year? We always like to have a goal, and the finances is one of those goals, not everything, but one of those goals that we have. So what's going to be the finance goal for this year? And so we said, look, the boys are getting to the stage now where they're starting to, to want to do things not with us. It's the stage now where so they have different ideas. They desperately want to work with Gavin and, uh, and try and earn some money farming and everything else. They get very excited by that. Um, and so they're thinking about different ways of how maybe they would start to move on. So we so we and I said, well, wouldn't it be great to have one last holiday together? Because we buy the holiday in the UK or holiday in, in the beaches in Indonesia. Now I know the holiday beaches in Indonesia are amazing. But that's the only place we've ever taken. Before. So the one would be great, we could go somewhere new. So I said, guys, you can go anywhere in the world as long as my air miles can take us there. And that was the, that was the goal. And that was the, the thing. And so the boys said, Joshua said I wanted to surf. Problem, Joel wanted to see animals. That's what Joel wanted, that's what Joshua wanted. So we ended up going to South Africa. It was an amazing two weeks. I mean, a great two weeks. It was an amazing memory that we've created for us, but also for the boys. Hopefully they remember for the rest of their lifetime. And as we were there, we were going to one place called Blind Canyon. Blind Canyon is this huge canyon that overlooks from the South African border to Mozambique. 800 kilometers long, um, and it's a really, really huge canyon, and it's beautiful. And when you get there, there is one particular point that's called God's Viewpoint. And as you stand there, you can see all the way over to Mozambique. Apart from the day that we went. <laughs> <laughs> this is the day that we went. We couldn't see more than 20 meters ahead. And so we were there, and we'd taken three hours to get there. It was really not part of our itinerary, really, but we really made a big thing of going there. And so we were there, and we just laughed. As all we could see was the cloud ahead. And there's that little kind of um, thing in front of you that shows you what you could have seen, which is really helpful. You know, oh, that's what we should be able to see, but we can't see anything more than 20, 30 meters ahead. Is that you today? Is that you today? Are you standing? What's viewpoint? Are you standing where you believe you should be, but you can't see anything more than 20? That you're there going, God, I don't understand why I got this news, why I didn't get the promotion, why I didn't get the health news I wanted, why I didn't get the news about my son or daughter. Or maybe struggles with anxiety, depression. And you're going, God, every week I turn back to you. I stand and I sit in church. I'm trying to see my future with your perspective, with God's viewpoints. I see his cloud. I see his darkness. Is that you this morning? Maybe it's not. Maybe your life's good. Maybe your life's great. But it says in the Psalms, when you walk through the darkest valley, when, not if, there will be times when you walk through the darkest valley. So this morning I just want to look briefly at some ideas of how when we walk through the darkest valley, or when we are right now walking through the darkest what should be our attitude? What can we do? What can we learn from the Bible to say? This morning we're going to turn to a passage in Hebrews 11. It's called sometimes the Hall of Faith because it's all about the Old Testament greats. And it talks about what made them so good that they ended up in the Hall of Faith. Well, you know, sometimes now within sport we have the, the Hall of Fame for the Premier League or for basketball players. The great players that ended up being the best of the best, they're in the Hall of Fame. But in Equals 11 we have the Hall, not of Fame, but of Faith. 
So what made them ending up being in this area? Because by learning from some of their stories, I believe it can help us when we walk through the valley of death. The first question I have this morning is quite simple. is what is faith? You see that it's from verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Actually, it's Romans, but that's because of this. I blame Paul for that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we can't see. Faith is being certain of what we cannot see. See, yeah. Uh, I did this in my church last month, so you can also see it in Indonesia. <laughs> Faith, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? We talk about it a lot within church. Have, having to have faith. It's tough, it's difficult. And we sometimes, especially as we get older, it's sometimes easier for us to live by faith when we're young. As we get older, when we get a mortgage, we get kids, we get responsibilities, it becomes harder. We start to, we start to live not by faith, but by living by what we perceive others may have for us. But we also see in verse 6, it says, but without faith, we can't please God. Tough that, isn't it? Tough that we cannot please God if we do not live by faith. So how do we live by faith here within Princeton? When so many of our needs often are met. But here within this chapter, we see different points that I want to take. So first of all, we're going to say, we're going to see that these guys that ended up in the call of faith, first of all, they persevered. Verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They persevered. They didn't give up. They didn't stay. This was a season of their lives. They kept on moving forward. To illustrate this, I have a story of a guy called Jadav Payen. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's from India. And in 19, yes, right, 87, he was walking around his little area. And then one day he went out to the sand dunes and he realized that all the sand dunes now are taking all the vegetation away. And he found 15 snakes that have died because they've been exposed to the, to the heat. He felt really upset. I personally would have been quite happy. But he, <laughs> he was a better person than me, and he was quite upset. And so what he decided to do was plant 20 bamboo saplings. Now, bamboo grows pretty quickly, but the saplings are tiny. That's what he did. The next day, he did the same thing. The next day, he did the same thing. He did this for 40 years. And now that little vegetation has grown into a forest that is 1,300 hectares wide. That's 1,300 football pitches wide. So big now that now the Indian tiger, the Indian elephant, the, uh, the rhino has all come into that uh, forest of vegetation and see there. We often, we, often over sorry, we often overestimate what we can achieve in one year, but we underestimate what we can do in a lifetime of faithful. Service. Often estimate what we can do in one year. Jadam in one year didn't really achieve much, but he kept on persevering. So these guys were faithful to the end. Second thing I want to say from these guys, they were persistent. Verse 30. I'm not getting old, I can't read. Well, um, without taking my glasses off now, so uh, by faith the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. We know the story of Joshua. Joshua was walking around the the, the, uh, the Jericho walls for six days. They had to walk around um, every single day. Then on the seventh day, they walked around six times. Twelve times now they had walked around. Not one stunned for them. 
Not one little bit of encouragement. And you're probably going, hey Joshua, God, oh, just a few stones fall out. Let me know that I'm not a nutter. And I'll be really, really good here because this looks really strange. That I've got all the praise and worship team going up the front. And it's not the greatest of weapons, a guitar. You know, they're at the front. All my fighters are at the back. They're all thinking, what is this guy doing? So come on, just a few stones fall out. Twelve times, no encouragement. Twelve times, they didn't see what God was about to do. Twelve times, they just walked and trusted. They were persistent. Sometimes, it's not easy to be persistent. So Fear and I, we celebrated our 18th anniversary just uh, six weeks ago. And it was great. So we did something uh, a bit different. We haven't normally celebrated our anniversary for a while since COVID, really. Uh, so we thought we'll go out. We thought we'll go and see the, uh, the show Hamilton. Thought I'll get a discount. I didn't. But anyway, <laughs> uh, and so we went and saw Hamilton. Uh, and so we had a great evening and a great weekend. That was an extraordinary date night. The other 51 weeks of the year would be doing date night. But ordinary. We go out for a meal, we talk, go home. I can't really remember most of the 51 other times. But by doing the ordinary things persistently helps Kate cultivate a strong relationship. By doing the ordinary things persistently, it cultivates a strong relationship. Same with you and I, God. If our relationship with God is determined by the extraordinary, the goosebump moment sometimes we get. And don't get me wrong, Tim and I were there in Spinaris when I was 20, when I was 19. Going down the front with Clive Calvert, asked people to go forward because they wanted you know, to walk, walk into mission. I was there. I was down the front. I remember it. I can still feel it now. The different times with Yvonne when working down a friend's mission. And going, it was amazing at different moments you have those times. But the majority of time, we go to church, give me for saying this. Now, not to say the worship team have been brilliant, they've been brilliant this morning. Not to say that we don't strive for excellence. Of course we would, we should. We go to church, we go to house group. But because we do it week in, week out, we don't even sometimes see the difference in the way that we think or perceive, but we cultivate what? A stronger relationship with God. Seemingly mundane activities can have extraordinary outcomes if we do them week in, week out. I love how the message puts it in Romans 12. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. The sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around, life, and place it before God as an offering. Ordinary. The ordinary walk with God, do it persistently. As you do that, you will see the strength of your relationship. Thirdly, extraordinary. <laughs> this is what happens, right, when you ask your children and Tim to do the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> they think this is hurtful. At some point, you just have to let them have their little money. <laughs> the sad reality is, I think it was more Tim than my children. <laughs> but they're giggling out the back. I was wondering why they kept looking at each other and like, what's going on? We continue, <laughs> Timothy, continue. Third point, they were not privileged. They were not privileged. Verse 31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed when those were disobedient. Rahab, the prostitute. She's in the form of faith. Let's get our heads around that just briefly. This is the greatest 
people who have lived out their lives full of faith. And in the middle of them is Rahab. And so sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's easy, and sometimes people say, Oh, John, I can't be like you. Oh, John, you're going off to Indonesia. You're kind of like a general in the army of God, and you're amazing, but I'm just at the back here. Oh, not like that. It's about us all understanding. We can all live by faith. And Rahab, even though her past was not in line with the kingdom of God, because she chose to live by faith, ended up being acclaimed within the hall of faith. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you this morning, your past does not discount you from being a Christian, but secondly, living by faith. Don't let the devil have that hold over you. Rahab changed to her future and her, her destiny by living by faith. For you today. And then, fourthly, in this time it is going, we see that we're all persecuted. Verse 35 and 38. 35 to 38. We were received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others still were chained and put in prison. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. We don't need to carry on. I think we get the picture. It's not a nice picture. It's like, this is not a great outfit of the kingdom of God. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but why did he put these three verses in? They were stoned, sawn in two. Are you sure? Why would you put this in? Because that's, sadly, reality. That is the reality that even within friends, we will get persecuted in different ways for living up for our Christian faith. Going harder. Suddenly the world is, is shifting in their ideals. And where does the church sit and stand in all of that? So if you choose to live by faith, you will be persecuted for it. A few, um, about six months ago, I received a letter from one of my old colleagues that worked there for 10 years loved and cared for this guy. He had moved on from the organization I was working for, um, and there would become a little bit of a distance. But, you know, in essence, we'd worked together for 10 years. This is one of the guys I've been to war with. This is one of the guys that I've, you know, been all over Indonesia with. In this letter, I wrote, read it, and it was pretty horrible. Put it mildly. I showed Sophia, and Sophia was like, wow, he hates you. But not much he hates me, you know, dislikes me, so no, no, he hates you. And, wow, to get that kind of letter from someone who you've worked with, it's tough. It means you doubt yourself, you doubt your faith, you doubt your choices, you doubt what you have done. But that's just the reality. When you come under attack, these things start to happen. As I shared, we went to South Africa, and one of the things that Joel was really passionate about was he wanted to go and uh, see the lions. He wanted to go and see the wildlife, and so we went on a safari for a couple of days in Kruger Park. It was amazing. And we got really, really close to the lions. It was the very first safari we went on, and so it was great. So we were there for about 20, 30 minutes, and we were enjoying watching them as, as they were out of this watering hole. And they were about, no word of a lie, about six or seven meters away from us. I know there's always a suspicion that I exaggerate the truth, but I promise you, that is about exactly their rights. So we thought after about 25 minutes it was time for us to go. And so then suddenly then the, the tour guide said, okay, John, we're leaving now, great. And we turned the car around, but it didn't stop. Okay, and he tried a few times, it did stop. So I'm thinking, I'm not getting that to push. Um, but he then realizes that the, the battery has got flat. So he put radios into his uh, base, none of them are picking up, uh, none of our phones are working. So I'm like, great, there is a 
family of lions about seven meters down there. And of course, if you see the next picture, of course, when you're on a um, safari, um, it's very obvious that the car you're in has no windows. So quite literally, if the, if the cat wants to come up and has another steak for, for lunch, there is nothing stopping him. And so we just sat there now for 25, 35, 45 minutes as these lions just keep looking over at us, not paying that much attention, but I'm starting to panic a little bit. Eventually, another car comes along and pulls us out. But of course, as we do that, our guide has to jump out and connect our car to his car. As he does that, these lions all stand up and start walking towards us. And so we take a few gulps of breath, and eventually we get pulled out, the, car, the battery kicks in, and we move on. In the middle of persecution, don't run. When you're getting attacked, don't run. When you're in the middle of the valley, don't run. Stay with in the community. Stay with the people that, that surround you who love you. It's sometimes easy in those times to run. You run on your own, you're going to get eaten in the world. You run on your own at those particular times. That's when you lose sight of who you are and what God can do. In a vineyard, you see that the vineyard is often so beautiful. And they have to put the grapes or the, um, um, the plant up across the trellis. If they don't, the plants just grow on the floor. And if they grow on the floor, they can never fruit. It is only being attached to the trellis allows the fruit to be able to blossom. It is only by being attached to a local church that your Christian faith will be allowed to blossom. My encouragement to you, when you are under attack, stay close to the church. Don't run. Be a part allow your fruit to blossom right here in front of the gospel channel. As I finish, you see in Hebrews 12, verse 12, the verse that I want to finish with. <clears throat> Here now that the writer is talking to the, uh, the church and just giving them some advice. And his advice is quite simple. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. What that means is, I don't know, but there are times when, sometimes in our Christian walk, as a leader, it can feel like sometimes we're in a boxing match. When I got that letter from one of my colleagues, uh, one of my ex-colleagues, I felt like I got hit on the nose. And when you're, if you're, if you're a boxing fan, you will know that if you see these good boxers, they can be in a fight and they keep on going. And suddenly when they're starting to lose, what goes first? It's the legs. The legs start to wobble. And when the legs start to wobble, you know one more punch on the chin and it's all over. And here we see the writer of the Hebrew say to the church, when you're under the cosh, when you're up against it, Strengthen your legs, your wobbly knees. And you know what? How do I do that? <coughs> By having Tim around me. By having Sophia around me. By having people supporting me like you guys. And so in the midst of the of the of the of the race, in the midst of the fight, in those moments. I can have people that say, John, strengthen your legs. It's okay, we'll get through that. Don't believe the lies. It's not true. Keep going, keep persevering. That's church. That's being one body. Yes, we can have one body, we can have communion together, but also being one body is being in community that supports one another during those times that enables your legs to be strengthened, enables you to be able to go through that season. And guess what? When you can do that, it means your arms are no longer feeble. What's that mean? If you can raise your arms, it's that image within the kingdom of God of blessing. 
outreach, embrace. You can only do that if your legs are strong. So raise up your feeble arms. Let them stretch out to the community of friends as you guys strengthen each other's legs by being there for one another. Enable you to keep serving, to keep praying, to keep blessing. When Moses was winning the war, arms stretched. Let friends in gospel chapels' arms be outstretched. But you can only do that if you surround one another with strong legs. Because there will be times when people want to punch. There will be times when the devil goes, I think I've got close to them. I think they're on the verge of being knocked down. When you need that, that's when you need to be around you. I finish with this story. He started at God's viewpoint. We were there. We couldn't see anything. We could see 20 meters ahead. A few hours later, some came. A few hours later, suddenly the clouds started to clear. And as the clouds started to clear, I could see what God could see. Future. What God is will be doing. If you're going through a tough season, trust the season will come to an end. And soon the clouds will start to lift. And then you will see what God sees. His future for you. Trust as you stand in God's viewpoint today. This morning, clouds at some point this week, next month, next year, I don't know when, but I believe the clouds will lift and move, and you can see. see. Yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> Let me close in prayer. Dear Father, I just want to thank you that you're a God that continues to love and to guide us. I want to thank you for the incredible encouragement as we look at Hebrews 11. And we look at the people within Hebrews 11 and we can identify with them because they're so much like us. These are not super Christians. They were normal people who had their own challenges, own issues, own doubts. They lived by faith all of their lives. I pray for the congregation here in friends. I pray, Lord, that you enable them to strengthen each other's wobbly needs and enable their feeble arms to be uh, strengthened so they can lift out those arms to the community of friends. And bring about that peace, that restoration, that hope so many people are looking for. Realizing it's not going to be found in politics. It's not going to be fire found in it. money. It's going to be found in you. But it requires your church, your people, to strengthen each other's needs, enable them to reach out. We pray for these things. We pray for this church. In Jesus' name. stories of water think you're like what I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers. For Yeah.
searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know just what we need before we say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am Love